right. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill to men who believe. There's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself an offering for sin. He was sacrificed for the transgressions of the people of God. Uh, he's the Passover, the eternal Passover for everyone that will believe. And some people think they don't need a Passover. And so they say, we don't believe in your theology. We don't agree with you, with your doctrine. Then I say, well, what do you got? What do you, what do you got? And they say, nothing. I say, well, I'll stick with what I got. God is a ever-present help in time of trouble. To those who call on him, believe, and uh, talk to him. you got to talk to God. The more you talk to God, but you got to talk to him according to truth. In other words, according to what the Bible says, not according to what some other book says. There's only one God, and the word of God is in the Bible. There's only one word of God. God doesn't have multiple books saying different things. There's only one book that says or tells you the works of God, tells you the word of God, tells you the works of God, the, the things that God has done personally on the earth. So here we are at uh, the last part. This is definitely the last part. I'm going to get to the end of this uh, information that I have uh, here uh, in this message. I'm not going to do another one. It's the 20th message on the false doctrine in Romans. And, you know, we believe that Paul of Tarsus wrote that book. So, you know, obviously he he had a few screws loose. <laughs> Some believe he was the first pope. And uh, then after this, I'm going to start on 1 Corinthians. And it just, it's amazing what I'll discover as I move through each book. It'll be amazing. Because it's been amazing doing Acts and Romans. Well, Acts especially. The things that I... I discovered in, in go, looking through the book of Acts, you know. Really, people, you know, some people say, oh, it can't be true because, you know, we believe in the writings of Paul and we don't believe the stories about Paul in Acts. That's those who actually read the Bible. Some people don't even know and they don't, they don't care and they don't, but they claim, they might claim to be a believer, but then they don't read they don't read the, the the Bible, you know. So this this message is a bit annoying because it's information that could be believed if you wanted to believe in his interpretation, but I don't believe in his interpretation. Uh you know, so let's get into it. Uh, all right, so we're looking at, actually we're picking it up at uh, verse 6. I stopped at verse, I only did one verse in the last message, just, just one verse. Uh, and then I went into another verse that I wasn't really part of, Romans. But I only did one verse in, in Romans. So... I have more to go. Let me get going on it here. 
so verse 6 says, even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Because if you... It, what is this really saying? We're talking about good works. We're not talking about just, you know, nine to five job or just, you know, cleaning the house or anything. We're talking about good works, works done in God. We're talking about serving God. We're talking about things that you do according to the will of God, the commandments. We're talking about doing the sayings, the commandments, the laws, the ordinances and the statutes of God. But there's no such thing, and it's, it's God imputes righteousness. So, so it's like saying that God imputes righteousness or makes somebody righteous if they don't do any good works, that it, they don't do a single thing, not a single solitary thing that's good. That's what it's saying. Then everybody's saved then. Everybody. Everybody's going to be granted an entrance into the kingdom of heaven eventually. Or to the paradise of God, to the holy city, to the, the new Jerusalem city that comes down out of the sky. It goes on to say, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Well, I'm going to read where this comes from. I have it right next to this, right on next in line. And so we're going to see, you know, is this exactly the way it was? No, it's not. It's not exactly the way it was in, in the book of David, or otherwise known as the book of Psalms. Well, it wasn't all David. It was a lot of Psalms were written by David, and some were not written by David. But before I even look at it, um, let me read the last verse. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, he will not, he will not impute sin to somebody who has is repented and has uh, made a decision and a commitment to not sin and who is not sinning, who is doing the right thing. That's who the one uh, is that will not have sin imputed to them. Not to somebody who's sinning. Let's make this clear. Okay, so let's look at Psalms 32. Move that up. Psalms 32, 1 through 7. Verse 1, a psalm of David, masculine, that means instruction. They said instructive, but I say instruction. Same thing. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, right? Whose sin is covered. Well, it's covered because you're not doing it anymore. <laughs> That's why. Or you're trying not to do it. You're doing everything you can with all your strength, all your ability. Verse 2, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes not iniquity. But then we have the part that, that Paul re neglected to put in his writings. <laughs> it says, In whose spirit there is no guile. So that's not in the writings of Paul. So we see that that's who the man is who doesn't have his sin uh, imputed, that doesn't uh, uh, get punished for sin because he's not sinning. That's why. So what so 
that's a big deal, too. I mean, if a person doesn't have any guile, that's a big deal. It's a big deal to me. It's a big deal to God. So I got a good definition of guile, because what's guile? You know, is that some kind of a condiment or what? You know, people don't go around, don't go around talking about things and use the word guile. They don't, they don't do it anymore. It's an old word. You find that uh, that the other translations use the words that are in this definition of guile. So that's good. It's one of the good things. In uh, you know, one of the great things in other translations when they use more modern words. But just when they get it totally wrong, that's not good. Okay, guile is deceit. Okay, so what's that? What's deceit? And deceit is the act or practice of deceiving people. There's a lot of people who want to do that. It is also the hiding. Uh, so deceit is also the hiding of or distortion of the truth. Oh, there's a lot of that going around. A lot of preachers, most preachers are distorting the truth and hiding it. They are. They just say something, you know, real flowery, you know, something that sounds good, and then they leave it at that. Uh, it is also the hiding or, or distortion of the truth for the purpose of misleading people. <laughs> and that is so true. And like I say, most preachers, that's their, their sermon for the week is a misleading sermon. It's not, you know, it's not going to give you the, the bottom line facts of the Bible. No. They want to just give you a little moral instruction and send you on your way. And it says, it can also be considered fraud and cheating. So this person who has their sins forgiven and their sins covered and not uh, uh, is not considered to be uh, unrighteous before God and does not have uh, sin imputed to them, is a person who is good. <laughs> so they're not doing it. That's pretty clear. They're not doing anything uh, deliberately, uh, consciously sinning. Uh, you know, it's because it says in the Old Testament, they, the ones that were doing it ignorantly could be forgiven. If they didn't do it ignorantly, if they did it with knowingness, knowingly, then they wouldn't be forgiven. And only God can judge that. Then it goes on. Verse 3. There we go. And then he starts talking about different things here. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long, or all the day long. So I said, what in the world does that mean? What do you mean roaring? What is he, like a lion? Is he trying to act like a lion, or what is he doing? <laughs> so I had to get another version of that to find out and most versions use the word groaning. So we have the ESV right here, see? Which is the English uh, standard version. And, mo and many of them, and most of them, use the word groaning, which makes a lot more sense. For when I kept silence, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. So all he was doing was groaning, but... We want to know what he should have been doing. He said he kept silence. So it wasn't really a, 
he wasn't really speaking, he was just groaning, which is not totally silent, but it's not speaking anything. It's not speaking the truth, you see? So what is he saying here? So then he goes on and says, uh, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Into the drought of summer. So in other words, he had no oil. He had no, uh, he had no spirit. He, he didn't have the anointing of God. Uh, on him. And it says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity have I not hid. Well, that's not true. He hid his, he tried to hide his iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Oh, so that's all you have to do. You can sin all you want, right? disregard all the commandments and sin all you like and then just tell God, you know, God, by the way, I did all these bad things. And then God just, oh, thanks for telling me. Now you can be forgiven. Now that you told me about that. That certainly isn't true. Uh, and like I was saying, you know, he hid... When David, you know, wanted uh, the woman there, Bathsheba, Bathsheba uh, and took her and then got her pregnant, uh, he big time tried to hide it, so much so that he was willing to kill the husband. He tried to hide it. He brought the, the man back. Uh, back to the, you might say, the homeland, uh, back to the, the Jerusalem uh, from the from the battlefield because he was out on the battlefield, and he tried to get him to uh, sleep with his wife so that when the baby came, then they would just say, "Oh, we've got to." kid we've got a child and uh, he wouldn't be the one to be exposed as being the father you see at least not in the near near future and so uh, that didn't work he got drunk so this guy was a drunk the you Uriah the Hittite he was the he was the uh, husband of Bathsheba so he was a drunk and that's when he came back from the war he didn't go see his wife he didn't even apparently he didn't even like her all he did is get drunk so that plan failed so then uh David had to uh, continue to hide his transgression. If he was really familiar with the Bible, he would have not. He, he would have said, this mar woman is married. I'm not touching her. I'm not going any anywhere near her. She's already married. She's married. But he didn't do that. He didn't care. Talk about, talk about not knowing what was in the uh, Lara Moses, the books of Moses. So then he uh, told his uh, his general, you know, put him right near the wall, send him right near the wall of the city that you're attacking, and then withdraw from him. Uh, I don't know how they did that, but, you know, I don't know how the general agreed to do that. I would, I would not have agreed to do it. I would have, I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that, and then not do it. Oh, gee, it failed. I didn't get to do it, uh, you know. 
But obviously it worked and the guy died. You know, he was right near he was right near the the wall of the city and somehow he was killed. And he wasn't gonna tell anybody because at that point nobody was gonna know. He he thought he was in the clear. And then not until the prophet came to him and confronted him. The prophet came and confronted him and said, you know, you're the one. You're the guilty party. There's a long story that goes with that. And uh, he said, oh, I've sinned. Yeah, now that you're caught red-handed, <laughs> now he confessed his sin. Now that he was bagged, now that it was known that you know, now that God had revealed that to him, I don't know if they revealed it to, uh, I, I wouldn't think that they revealed it. I don't know. I don't know if it says that, that they revealed it to all Israel, that he had done that. I, I, I would think not. I, I don't think they made an announcement to everybody. I think it probably came out later, you know, when everybody was dead. <laughs> and I doesn't tell you. So, moving on, verse 6, it says, uh, so it goes on to say, I'm going to read the next two verses. We'll see what we can find in this. For this shall everyone that is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Oh, I agree with that. I mean, and it, it's not clear why it's saying for this. And so we confess this sins, and it doesn't necessarily make too much harmony between the two. Uh, For this shall everyone that is godly pray to you in a time. And, and really, in reality, that is a very, very true statement in the fact that everybody that is godly prays. Because Jesus, Jesus said, go into your closet and pray to God, pray to the Father, pray to your Father. And if, if somebody's not doing that, then they're not godly. You cannot be godly. You cannot be... Uh, Jesus said you were a hypocrite. In other words, you were claiming to be godly and you were not. For everyone that is godly, pray to you at a time when you may be found. Yeah, first thing in the morning is the best time, but even late at night, as long as every day. As long as you do it every day, I mean... Otherwise, you, it's like you're estranged from God. You can't know somebody that you don't talk to. You know, it's amazing that Jesus said you need to, you can actually talk to the Creator, the one that raises the dead. You know, that creates food out of thin air uh, for five thousand people. The one that changes the weather one that heals diseases and does more than I even know. He says, you can talk to that person, <laughs> which is amazing. It's an amazing thing. He actually says you have to, really. But it's really an honor, to say the least. I mean... I can go on about that, but... And it says, uh, surely in the floods of great waters they shall come, uh, they shall not come near to him. And this is, I read the other versions that were much better uh, than that. I didn't put another version of that. Uh, it's basically saying the same thing. In other words, if there's a flood, you won't be drowned. Or, you know. uh, they won't come to your house. They won't flood your house and it says uh, and that's that's one way of putting it if you pray to God then that's going to save you from trouble he says God will re reward you in the open or reward you in your life verse 7 you are my hiding place you shall preserve me from trouble so you, you go into the closet and pray to God you're, you're that's your hiding place. You shall preserve me. You shall preserve me from trouble 
you shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. So now we go to Romans 6. Hopefully I'll get through this quickly. Okay, I can get through this in the next five minutes or so. Uh, Romans 6, 2 through 13. That is a lot of verses. God forbid, sh how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? See, I don't agree with a lot of this stuff. When I said it would be annoying is I don't agree with this because it's, it's an interpretation that I just don't think is scriptural. But it's easy to believe. I'm just going to say that I don't agree with what he's saying. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? Well, who said we're dead to sin? As long as we're in the flesh, we're, we're not dead to sin. There's no such thing. There's no, no such thing as being dead to sin. No. You can be not sinning. You can be in a saved state. You can be doing the will of God. You can be keeping the commandments of God. But to say that you're dead to sin is nonsense. That's hogwash. Verse 3. Don't you know that so many of us were baptized, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Well, I don't agree with that. We're baptized into his life. I just think it's negative. Once again, sometimes Paul can be Paul was negative too, negative and, and very negative about things. Very negative, very negative. He he had a negative interpretation. Now we're baptized into his life, and so the, you know I I did a message, uh, two thousand eighteen, seven part message. And uh, all about baptized. I'm all, all about the word, all about baptism, using the word baptized, baptism, baptizing. And uh, here's one verse from Mark 1 4. John did baptize in the wilderness. And preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So that's what we're talking about water. And then another thing I learned is that a lot of times it'll say they were baptized, or they won't say if it's water or they were baptized in the Spirit. And I don't believe it ever says they were bow baptized in the Spirit. I don't think it says that. It says they were filled with the Spirit. That word is used a lot in a lot of different ways in the Gospels and in the New Testament. But here, it, we find, well, what is baptism? You know, is he talking about water baptism or, or is he talking about the Spirit? Uh, well, John said it was the baptism of repentance. In other words, I'm saying that you it's like you go into the water and you're cleansed. It's like a, a symbol of being cleansed by the Spirit. You're cleansed by the, the power of God. You go into the water, you get, you get, get cleaned. Into the water, cleaned, and you come out of the water. But he, he had a totally different interpretation. A negative one. And what I wrote here is an act of willingness to change, so I'm saying that the that baptism is an act, you know, water baptism. So, so water baptism is an act of willingness to change. When somebody is baptized, it's an act of willingness to change, to repent, and to be cleaned by keeping the commandments of God. Uh, the water being a symbol. I think I changed that at one time. All right, so that would be yeah, the water being a symbol. And then we have, then we also have Matthew. And what did Jesus say about baptism? He didn't say too much. He didn't say much at all. This is one verse where it's 
talked about baptizing, but it, once again, it doesn't say whether it's in water or in the Spirit. But either way, it doesn't say anything about being baptized into his death, which he's going to talk about down here. Then it gets really thick down and through here. Um, in the next verses that I'm going to read, it gets really thick. But Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore teach all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because then in Acts, they kept saying, you have to be baptized in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, you be baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. See, so we have a conflict there. Then we have verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. No. No, I don't believe that. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. It's very easy to say, oh, you go into the water, then you're raised up. You go, you die in the water, and then you come out. But I don't, I'm not, I'm not buying that interpretation. Because Jesus was baptized uh and no talk there was no talk of uh, you know being baptized into his death or anything like that because then the spirit came uh afterwards that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life well i agree that we should walk in newness of life I mean, that statement is, is, you know, that last part of that statement is, you know, it's, you can't really say it's bad. It's good. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's it's logical. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together, we're not planted. No, we're not planted in the water. <laughs> He's saying we're planted. It says, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. No, we're not planted in the likeness of his death. I'm not. I'm not buying that. We also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh, so as long as we're dunked in the water, then we'll be, we'll be resurrected, right? It's hogwash. It's hogwash. So knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Now we say our old man is crucified with him. I mean, is he talking about the water? Now he's saying that something else. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Now he's saying the body is a body of sin. I don't agree with that either. I'm not going to buy that. Uh, so now we just jumped. Now he's just talking about the crucifixion. He's talking about the crucifixion. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now he's saying you have to be dead to be freed from sin. Wrong. That's not true. Very negative. You know, that we should. Uh, he's claiming that the body has to be destroyed. That the body is a body of sin and it has to be destroyed. And as long as you can destroy the body, then you'll be free from sin. No, no, no. Now that's that's uh, that's not true. That's negative. That that's just not true. It's just one way of, you can interpret many things, many ways. People have all kinds of crazy interpretations of things, you know, that, that are not provable by the Bible. Then he goes on in uh, verse 8. Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, so he's saying we have to be dead with Christ. Well, Christ's not dead. You see? Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And we'll be live with him if we have faith in him and faith in God. That's how we live with him. We'll do his will. We'll do his commandments. Justified by his doings commandments not justified by some imaginary faith but we're justified by faith in God by doing his commandments 
uh, verse 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, that's good. So the sacrifice of the Mass is alive, so that's a piece of truth right there. The, uh, the Catholics should memorize that verse. Death has no more dominion over him. That's totally true. That's totally true. For in that he died, he died to sin once, right? He doesn't need to be, you don't have to have a sacrifice of the mass and sacrifice Jesus every time you have a, a church meeting. But in that he lives, he lives to God. Oh, it's true. That's totally true, this, that statement. So a lot of this stuff in here, some of it's true. Verse 11, likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead in, no, no, no. It's just not scriptural. It it's, doesn't make any sense uh, to be dead to sin. Uh, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, he never says what sin is either. He's dead to sin. What sin? Which sin? Sin is transgression of the law. He said he, he would justify. He, he said you would justify without keeping any commandments. So why is he talking about, you know, being dead to sin? According to him, there is no sin if you believe in Jesus. That's his Jesus. That was his uh, full, uh, doctrine. That was his theology. Why should you be dead to sin if you don't have to? If you don't have to keep any commandments? It's ridiculous. You know? And then he says some things which, you know, on the surface make some sense, I suppose. Let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lesser of... But then he never says what sin is. A lot of times, he doesn't really say what sin. Well, which sin? There's little things and there's big things. There's major sins and then there's small sins. There's a sin unto death, it says, in, uh, I believe, in the uh, epistle of John. Uh, and in the last verse, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. What sin? But yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Well, I, I don't have a major problem. I mean, that, is, that statement alone is, is definitely uh, good. But there's no detail, you know, because he's saying... You know, he's saying instruments of unrighteousness. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Unrighteousness. What is that? He doesn't say. He says you don't, have to, you don't have to keep any commandments. You don't have to do any good works. That's his, that's his theology. That was his uh, preaching to a certain body of people. And then the other people, he was saying something different. But we don't really have a, a lot of writings of him saying... Because we know that he was, uh, you know, from my message on the, the false doctrine in Acts, we know that he was doing, he was actually sacrificing animals with the Jews. He was, he was actually sacrificing animals. How can that be? How can the man be sacrificing animals, practicing the law of Moses by submitting to the sacrificing of animals, and then turn around and write these things, it's, it's the epitome of hypocrisy, of uh, being uh, double-minded, two-faced. Uh, it's mind-boggling. 